male privilege has been defined as the system of unearned advantages or rights that are available to men solely on the basis of their sex. According to feminist ideology, all men receive a patriarchal dividend from living in a male-dominated society that oppresses women. And since the assumption of male supremacy is woven into the fabric of social institutions, most men remain oblivious to their privileged status. As evidence of this unseen prejudice, gender theorists point to the difference in average earnings between men and women, as well as the lack of female representation in positions of leadership. According to the World Economic Forum's annual report, the so-called gender gap has yet to be closed in any country. Women still lag behind men in economic participation and opportunity, educational attainment, health and survival, and political empowerment. A cursory glance at the data, however, reveals that the picture painted by feminist academics could not be further from the truth. The idea of male privilege can be refuted with a simple statistic. In every country around the world, women outlive men. Globally, average female life expectancy at birth is five years longer than for males. According to Warren Farrell, men's higher mortality rates give the lie to the myth of male power. If power is defined as having control over one's life, then there can be no greater loss of power than the loss of life. Over 90% of occupational fatalities are suffered by men who work in the so-called death professions, industries like deep-sea fishing, logging and construction. Contrary to popular opinion, men have always been the primary victims of war. Since males make up the vast majority of frontline soldiers, they are the ones most likely to die in armed conflict. But even among civilian populations, men are more likely to be taken hostage and executed by belligerents. The leading cause of mortality worldwide, heart disease, also disproportionately affects men, reflecting their increased exposure to risk factors like chronic stress and loneliness. Perhaps the most damning statistic for the myth of male privilege is the gender difference in suicide. Globally, men are twice as likely to kill themselves as women, and three to four times more likely in developed nations. This begs the question, if men enjoy a privileged existence relative to one half of the population, why would so many of them choose to end it prematurely? The answer, according to Farrell, is that male privilege is a code word for male disposability. What any other group would call powerlessness, men have been taught to call power. This cultural conditioning is deeply rooted in our biology. From an evolutionary perspective, women have always been more valuable to a group's survival than men because they are the limiting factor for population growth. Therefore, in order to survive, cultures had to devise elaborate ways to incentivize men to protect women and provide for them. Since males have a higher sex drive, access to female sexuality became the chief reward for altruistic behavior. This is symbolized in the hero myth. The white knight slays the dragon and wins the virgin bride. Historically, self-sacrifice for women was reified in the code of chivalry, and a knight errant was often motivated by courtly love. Since males compete among themselves for access to females, the most successful cultures were the ones who channeled this intrasexual competition into pro-social behaviour. By striving for status within socially approved hierarchies of competence, Men risked their lives to earn love and affection from women. In the process, they built the civilizations that we inhabit today. According to Roy Baumeister, this, and not patriarchal oppression, is the root cause of gender inequality. Men dominate society because they invented it.
The mistake that academics make is to look only at those above them, the so-called apex fallacy. After observing the privilege of rich white men, feminists falsely conclude that all men enjoy those same advantages, even in the sexual marketplace. When in reality, owing to female hypergamy, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. For whilst men may be overrepresented at the top of society, as CEOs, prime ministers and presidents, they are also overrepresented at the very bottom. Globally, over 90% of the prison population are male. Men are more likely to suffer from alcohol and drug addiction than women. And in many cases, prison is the only refuge for the men who make up two-thirds of the homeless population. In a very real sense, these dispossessed men can be thought of as the victims of female hypergamy. First, ruthless competition among men, often attributed to toxic masculinity, is driven by female mate selection. Since, by and large, women only partner with men who are above them in socioeconomic status, they are morally culpable for the worst excesses of the capitalist system. Hoarding wealth and displaying it through conspicuous consumption is rational behaviour in a society where women evaluate men based on cues for resource potential. The logical conclusion, however, is that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Nowhere is this inequality more apparent than in the sexual marketplace. Writing in the 1970s, Esther Vilar explained, the number of women a man can have is linked to his income. The bigger the income, the more women he has. Where there is a Hugh Hefner, who has them by the thousand at the top of the ladder, there are large numbers of men who cannot even afford one woman at the bottom. Since the male and female populations are roughly equal in number, every man who indulges himself in having two women is taking away another man's partner. The exchange of male resources for access to female sexuality lies at the heart of human society. Since men desire sex more than women, every man must pay for it in some way. Vilar said that prostitution is undoubtedly the best buy in the sexual marketplace, but by analogy, marriage is a covert contract in which men trade financial resources for sexual exclusivity. This is the real explanation for the gender pay gap. Men value intimacy from a woman so highly that they are willing to support their partner when she chooses not to work. By contrast, very few men can expect financial support from their spouse if they want to raise children or pursue their passion. Thus, the gender pay gap is an example of female privilege. Women earn less money than men on average because they have the financial support to work fewer hours. Women's advantages in life stem from the fact that female sexuality is valuable in a way that male sexuality is not. By virtue of her sex appeal, even an unemployed woman can secure commitment from a high-status man. By contrast, unemployed men who have nothing to offer a woman apart from their love and affection are condemned to perpetual celibacy. After living as a down-and-out in London, George Orwell concluded that the greatest evil in a poor man's life, besides malnutrition, is that he is entirely cut off from contact with women. The evil of poverty, said Orwell, is not so much that it makes a man suffer as that it rots him physically and spiritually. And there can be no doubt that sexual starvation contributes to this rotting process. Cut off from the whole race of women, a tramp feels himself degraded to the rank of a cripple or a lunatic. No humiliation could do more damage to a man's self-respect. Today, involuntary celibacy is the fate for many young men who are so-called neats, not in employment, education or training. Having come of age in an era of financial crises and economic stagnation, 
Their career prospects are grim. Devoid of looks, money and status, their romantic prospects are even worse. Just as these men will never know the joy of owning their own home, they will also never experience the warmth of emotional intimacy. Parasocial relationships with female content creators, who earn more in a day than the average man earns in a year, will be their only consolation. To add insult to injury, these disenfranchised young men are told by feminists and the mainstream media that they are privileged, whilst the women who profiteer from male loneliness online are oppressed. Meanwhile, modern women boast about not needing a man, whilst relying on the government and welfare state as a substitute husband. Within this gynocentric milieu, boys and men are accused of falling behind or failing to launch, whilst being actively discriminated against by schools and HR departments. Given these egregious attempts at gaslighting, is it any wonder that relations between the sexes are at an all-time low?